Good morning. Our first reading this morning is from the Gospel of John. It's found on page 1028 of the Pew Bible. On the third day, a wedding took place at Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there, and Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, They have no more wine. Dear woman, why do you involve me? Jesus replied, My time has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. Nearby stood six stone water jars, the kind used by the Jews for ceremonial washing, each holding from 20 to 30 gallons. Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water, so they filled them to the brim. Then he told them, now draw some out and take it to the master of the banquet. They did so, and the master of the banquet tasted the water that had been turned into wine. He did not realize where it had come from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. Then he called the bridegroom aside and said, everyone brings out the choice wine first, and then the cheaper wine after the guests have had too much to drink, but you have saved the best till now. This is the first of his miraculous signs Jesus performed at Cana in Galilee. He thus revealed his glory and his disciples put their faith in him. This is the word of our Lord. This morning, second scripture reading also in the New Testament from Paul's letter to the church at Rome. This, excuse me, I'm sorry. Yes, Paul's letter to the church at Rome. Thank you, Jim. The 12th chapter. Luckily, I'll be reading only the first two verses. And that can be found on page 1100 in your Red Pew Bible. Paul writes to the church, Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. May the Lord add his blessing. Jim. time I was with you, we journeyed to the town of Capernaum. This Sunday we're going to take a little journey to the village. Notice I said village of Cana. We're not really sure where Cana is located. Most people that deal with archaeology and all that kind of good stuff feel it was just a little bit north of Capernaum. And uh, one of the interesting things about it is that it's only mentioned four times in our Bible. Twice in John chapter 2, once in John chapter 4 with the healing of the royal official son, and then one more time in John chapter 21. And my question for you off the cuff is which one of the 12 disciples lived in Cana? Anybody know off the top of your cuff? Nathan. All right. So that's the only four times that the passage, uh, this town comes up in Scripture, and they're all in John's Gospel. And we want to be looking at John chapter 2 here in a moment. But before we do, I'd like to share a story with you. Kind of like a beautiful day like today, a Baptist pastor hopped in his car, and he's driving along, and all of a sudden, one of those dreaded things happened. No, it wasn't a flat tire. 
It was the blue lights. And it wasn't the blue light special at Walmart. <laughs> it was the one with the state troopers. And so he quickly pulled over his vehicle. Trooper come up to the car and asked him for, you know, those two pieces of paper. Let me see your license and uh, registration, please. He goes back to his car. A couple minutes on that little computer, comes back and says, all right, you're clean. But the reason I pulled you over is because your back brake lights weren't working. And then as he was about to leave the car, the pastor thanked him because he didn't know that. And boy, that's a terrible thing. We got pulled over once for one, one brake light that wasn't working in New Jersey. And uh, as the trooper was about to leave, he says, is that alcohol I smell in your car? And the trooper notices a thermos sitting next to the pastor in a passenger seat. And so he says, what's in that thermos? Pastor says, oh, there's only water in there, cold water. And the trooper says, let me see that thermos. And so the trooper unscrews the top of it, takes a smell, and he says, hey, that's alcohol. And a pastor looks at the trooper and says, Jesus did it again. <laughs> now, I want you to hold that thought. I want you to hold that thought. Because every one of us rides around with a thermos in our car that has something in it that we'd like to see changed. You hold that thought because we're going to be talking about that when we get to the end of the message. But as we jump into the story, there are four parts. If you're trying to take notes, I kind of try to make it easy for you. The first part deals with uh, here as they come together here. I call it the observation Observing what's going on. And it's a Jewish wedding. We have a Jewish wedding here. I love to go to weddings. And uh, I went to one and I don't really know how old exactly I was, but I was in that eight or nine or ten year old range. And it was on my mother's side of the family. They were Polish people. And I, anybody been to a Polish wedding? Ah, at least a couple of you have, all right. And one of the things I noticed right away, that two things I remember, is that, man, they ate some strange food. I never had pierogies till I went to a Polish wedding. And man, I was sold on pierogies. I don't care what you fill them with, I'm eating them. Second thing I got sold on was the music that they had. And I would see these people, man, they would guzzle down this and they would eat all this food. And then they'd go out to the dance floor and dance. And I don't say this disparagingly against um, Polish people, but most of the ones that were there were big people. I mean, big people. And man, they'd be out there dancing and moving. I never knew a big person could move that fast. And they'd come back to the table, they'd all be sweating, and, and they'd quick grab something to drink, and up comes another song, and they run back out the dance floor again. Man, I can, I can see that as plain as I can see you. And uh, what a great time they had. They were celebrating. I think of a, another wedding Karen and I were at, and you're the audience that were there at the wedding, and behind me was Noble Lighthouse. We were outdoors. Beautiful Saturday. And in comes a team of horses and a carriage. And the bride and all of her girls were on that carriage. What a sight to behold. 
And the reason why it was so great is because the seven Saturdays before it rained and the next three Saturdays afterwards it rained. That was the only nice Saturday, the Saturday they got married. But what a great outdoor wedding that was. What a great picturesque place to be. And then just last year, in November, we went to Killington, Vermont Ski Lodge. And a young lady that we have known for many years decided to have an outdoor wedding in November at Killington. <laughs> and I kept saying, Debbie, let's do this indoors. Man, it's gonna to be too cold. We can even have snow in Killington. But she was very persistent. And I must say the day of the wedding, again, if you were the audience sitting there, the only place the sun shone was on the chairs that were out there. They sat in the sun, they were comfortable. What a beautiful day for wedding in November. But let me say, when we first got there, they had no power. Power lines had come down, and uh, I think a transformer was, was destroyed, too, in the mix. And so they were running a lot of stuff by generators, but they finally got their, their power back. But weddings I love most of the time. Have you ever come home for a wedding and your ears would just go ba-boom, ba-boom, ba-boom for two weeks? Because the music was so loud you couldn't even talk to your person sitting right next to you. I've had a few weddings like that too. But what I want you to see here is that the wedding that took place in Jesus' day was a community affair. It just wasn't a family. People from all over the community came to the wedding. And any relatives far and wide came to the wedding. And we don't know much about the wedding uh, process, but we do know this, that when a man and a woman decide to get married, both families would get together. And they would draw up a marriage covenant we're not sure all of what was in that, but it was there. And then about a year later, the groom would come and grab his bride from his father-in-law's house and bring her to his house, and they would consummate the marriage. And then the next day would begin seven days of celebration. Man, aren't you glad you only had to pay for one day? <laughs> Imagine paying for seven. And so where we're at here, when we come to John chapter 2, we're somewhere in that seven-day stretch. We don't know if it's the third day, the fourth day. We don't know what day it is. But we're somewhere in that seven-day area. And we're told in that first couple of verses that we have a bride and groom who remain nameless. We don't know who they are. We have Mary, the mother of Jesus, who was there, obviously functioning in some sort of capacity to oversee things that were going on in the wedding celebration. And we have Jesus and his disciples that were invited to the wedding. We don't know how many disciples went. He might have had six by this time. But he is just starting his ministry. And I can't give you a good reason why Jesus was invited. Other than maybe... He knew the family. And maybe that was why Mary was there. We don't know. But let me just share this thought with you as we think about point number one here. 
Are there any areas in your life that you need to invite Jesus into? You know, if you were a perfect person, Jesus would be in all the areas of your life. He'd be there, you'd be all right. But we know that none of us here are perfect. And we all know that we have closed some doors to Jesus. And we said, oh, Jesus, you can't come in this back room of my life. I'll give you all these other rooms, but this one is off limits, Jesus. This is my room. And so I'd like you to think about the fact that even when you go to the hairdressers, it's nice to invite Jesus to come with you. When you go food shopping, when you go to the bank, when you go out with your friends, why not include Jesus in what you're doing? And I think that's a real challenge for us. Because many times we don't want people to see Jesus where we're at. And if I could use a current illustration, I don't think it will offend anybody because I think you're all big people. But the lady who was just questioned to sit on the Supreme Court, they wanted to see every aspect of her life except her religious aspect. They didn't want to see Jesus. So they said, you keep Jesus out of this hearing. You see, you can't do that as a Christian. You say you love God and you know God. Jesus needs to be a part of whatever you're doing. But he doesn't crash any doors down. He waits for that invitation. Yeah, you might be born again. That's great. But if you've got areas of your life that you're just holding back for whatever reason, you need to give them the Christ. You need to begin a process there. Second thing I'd like you to see is what I'd simply call the observation the observation. And again, a lot of details are left out. Mary comes up to Jesus, and what does she say? They have no more wine. We're out of wine, Jesus. Now, I find that kind of curious. Did you know that Jesus was in the winemaking business? No, he was a carpenter. He wasn't a winemaker. Why is Mary going to Jesus and telling him, we don't have any more wine? You got to think about that for a little bit. But I'd like you to think about something else that will be a lot easier is that because at that moment in time, Mary reflected back to her own wedding celebration. What was that like? It wasn't very positive, my friends. Because everybody was looking at Mary and saying, wow, Joseph's still going to marry her? even though she's pregnant. And think about the shame. Think about all the dirty looks she endured. Think about all the comments she had to hear. Because people could not understand and didn't want to believe what God was doing. And she knew that unless they had some more wine, this couple 
was going to endure that kind of shame. Because when you put on a party and ran out of food, that was a social disgrace. It's like having a Christmas Eve party and you invite all your friends over. And by the time the last 10 get there, you have no more food left. It was a disgrace in Jesus' day. Not to have wine for people to drink. And so she was feeling a little bit of that shame. She knew what would happen. They would be branded Mr. and Mrs. Stingy for the rest of their life. And wherever they went, the people would say, oh, there's the stingy ones. And so she came to Jesus. But I, I'd like to tell you why I think she came to Jesus. Scripture doesn't give us a clear answer. But I think it's there if you really look. I believe that she knew that Jesus could do something. After all, let's remember, this is Mary. Who visited Mary? What angel? Gabriel. Gabriel. And remember all the wonderful things that Gabriel told her about this son that she was going to bear. That he was the son of God. Think about the shepherds who came. What was their testimony? Then think about the kings that came. What was their testimony? Think about the day that they took Jesus into the temple on the eighth day after his birth to have him circumcised. What was the testimony of Anna? And I forget the priest's name. Uh, Simeon. Oh? No, Simeon in the temple. I think it was Simeon. What was their testimony? And she had all these things stored up in her, and she pondered them. And she raised this child. And she had that incident when he was 12 years old, and got separated from them. And Jesus said, shouldn't I be about my father's business? And so as she stood there, knowing that the wine was gone, was her observation. She knew that the only one that could do something was Jesus. And what I see here is she made a prayer request. Doesn't say she got down on her knees and prayed. It doesn't say she bowed her head. But she went to the only one who was capable of doing anything at that hour. And that was Jesus. So she said, we have no more wine. I love that simple prayer request. You know, you don't have to get complicated with God. God knows before we pray what our problem is. And then I like exactly what she did. After she said what she said, she said no more. Oh, if we could only be that way. Give our prayer to God and walk away. Believing as she was once told that nothing is impossible with God. Remember when that angel came? Angel said, nothing's impossible with God. And I believe that's what we see happening here. She knew that this was God's son. And she knew he had the capability of doing something. But she wasn't sure what or how. She left it all up to God. 
And then we have that response. I love that. Woman, how come you're involving me in this thing? My hour has not yet come. And that was a, a godly response to her. What he was simply saying there, hey, my time hasn't come to be manifested as to who I am yet. And so it's kind of like she was putting Jesus in a hard place. What was he going to do if the time had not come for him to be manifested or to let the world know that he is God's son? How's he going to act? What's he going to do? And that brings us to our third point, obedience. Obedience. How important that is. Because when she walked away from Jesus, what did she say? She said nothing to Jesus, but what did she say to the servants? Yeah. She said, hey, you servants, just do what Jesus tells you to do. And folks, sometimes that's hard. Because for God to do a miracle in your life, sometimes you've got to do something you think is stupid. Sometimes you think it's dumb to be doing that. Sometimes you say, man, that'll never bring me to point B. But you've got to do it. And you notice what Jesus says. He says, Fill up those six jugs. Now, you got to realize something here. I like to get into stories. They had no running water where they were. So there was no faucet to fix a hose onto and drag it over here and fill up six jugs. They had to go to the center of town where the well was. And they probably carried back about four gallons a piece, which meant that they made three or four, maybe even five trips to the well before these things were filled to the brim. So this miracle didn't happen instantly. It took some time. And you kind of wonder what's going on out there in the banquet hall. <laughs> Where's my wine? Where's those servants? Come on, I'm thirsty. We don't know what was going on. But we do know that these servants was working to bring that water in to fill it. I wonder what they thought. I'm sure they might have had the thought I would have had. What good is this going to do? We're putting water in these things? And then Jesus says, draw some out and take it to the banquet master. Man that was in charge of the banquet. And Let's just say here for a moment, just remember now, they filled it, filled to the brim, and Jesus said, draw some out. Now, Jesus didn't go up there and lay his hands on each jug. You know how he laid his hands on people and they were healed? So he had none of that going on. Jesus didn't bow his head and pray. Jesus did absolutely nothing that they could see physically that would change that water into wine. The only thing Jesus did that they couldn't see is by his thought. He willed that to happen. 
Jesus doesn't need to speak to have something happen. He says, my thoughts are not your thoughts. And all that Jesus had to do was say to himself, water, turn into wine. And it's done. It is done. And I can see those servants as they go up there to draw from those six water jugs. They had no problem dipping in and filling up that container. Do you know why? Oh, you got no, no wine drinkers here. No Baptists are going to confess to that, huh? <laughs> Let me tell you why. The smell. As they approached those things to draw, you could smell the wine. Whoa! What a fragrance was coming out of those pots. They knew it was wine. You know, what's one of the things those wine drinkers do? Right? They smell it. Those servants could smell the wine. And then they dipped in there and they took it to the master of the house. Let me just say this that if you want to be part of the blessings that God wants to do in the lives of others or yourself, you're going to have to learn to do some of the uncomfortable things, like fill the jugs with water and just be obedient, knowing that God has it all under control. That's why we miss out on blessings. That's why we miss out on miracles. Because we're not like the servants. We forget what Mary says. Just do what Jesus says. No more, no less. And if we do that in our Christian lives, we were going to experience miracles we're going to experience blessings. And so are those people around us as well. Let me just share here as we, as we think about it, what was the outcome like? What was the outcome? Well, the outcome was that the master of the ceremonies could not believe the taste of the wine. He had never tasted anything better than what he tasted on that day. He said, this is the best. And when you say something is the best, it compares to nothing else. It's the best. Now let me tell you, as Baptists, Jesus isn't going to make a junky wine. We believe that Jesus does things well and good. And that's what he did on this occasion. They had never tasted wine like this because this came straight from God. And that man says, gee, normally you serve your best first and then when your people get a little drunk and their taste buds can't discern good wine from bad wine, you feed them the rotten stuff. But here you're saving the best for last. He could not believe it. He could not believe it. Let me just say, if you remember in the Gospels, Jesus says, I'm not going to drink the fruit of the vine. Until when? The marriage feast. The marriage of the lamb with the bride. Friends, 
you will get a taste of that wine. That same wine that Jesus made in Cana will be served when the bride and the lamb celebrate their wedding. Yeah. And you know why you're going to taste it? Because Jesus is going to make it. He's going to make it. And so here the first outcome is that the groom, he couldn't understand it. He bought all the wine together. He had no idea what had happened. Second thing we're told is that in the process of Jesus doing this, his glory was revealed and those who were with him, the disciples, believed in him. They put their trust in him. They began to see that he is the Son of God. They began to see that he is the Messiah. And so that happened. Third thing I'd like to have you think about, and my wife and I, we had a little debate over this going home uh, one time, and uh, I said this was the best wedding gift that Jesus could have given this couple. And besides that, there was a lot of wine left over. Now, let's just say it's the second day of the week. How much wine do you think they could drink in the next four or five days? Just try and figure that out in your mind. Because I'm just going to say here, let's suppose each jug held 25 gallons. We'd have 125 gallons of wine. That's a lot of wine. And I don't care how much you love wine. On this little town, in this little village, there might have been maybe 125, maybe 150 people. There would be no way that they could consume all the wine that Jesus made. And I'd like to suggest to you that very possibly that that which was left, they simply kept some for themselves and sold the rest and were able to live on that gift for a while. Man, that's a lot of wine to drink. I didn't think you could drink that much water. Yeah, that'd be hard to drink all that water. But anyhow, that's just my opinion. But what I want to get at here and finish up with is that the thought of the wedding is how Jesus has the power to transform us, to change us. We don't have to stay the same. If I'm in my car riding around with a thermosphere full of fear, my God can change that to hope. And I need to give God that. And say, God, here is my thermos of fear. In the power of who you are, and because nothing's impossible with you, I pray that you bring hope into my life. God can take that thermos that might have some anger and resentment in it and turn it into love. So I ask, what is in your thermos today that you're riding around with? It's been habitually with you, but you need to deal with it because our God wants to change us Next Sunday, when we come here to worship, we should be different than what we are today. And different in a positive way. That we've grown more like Jesus Christ. And the only way that that can happen is if I'm willing to let Jesus 
transform what's in my thermos. So I ask you, what's in your thermos? And let's just remember, Jesus doesn't change us all at once. For some, the few, that might happen. But basically, it's a process where I give Jesus this, and then he helps me to deal with it, and he changes my life. And then I got to come back a week later and hand him something else to deal with. So as we're here today, I would just simply ask, what's in that thermos? Do you want God to change you? Or if you want to go into heaven dragging, what's in that thermos? And miss out on rewards that could be yours right now as God changes you for his glory, for his honor, and for his witness. Let's pray. Father, help us this day. Sometimes we, uh, Lord, sometimes we're just like that hoarder we see on TV. We don't want to give up the trash that we hold on to. We don't want to give up that which is rotten and has no value for the Christian life. We don't want to give up that which other people can see is wrong in us. God, help us not to be a hoarder of that which is negative. We pray that this day you would give us the courage to just simply get alone with you and say, God, help me. Help me to see that sin that's in my life and how I need forgiveness. God, help me to see what's wrong and give me the courage to lift that up in prayer to you. Lord, bless these, your people, and may their testimony be a bright one for you. For we ask it in Christ's name. Amen.